This is the lab that we were doing for the heat of combustion. I'm going to go through the work itself one by one. So on the first page we have these four molecules and we're trying to figure out what the structure looks like. And I'm also going to write down how many bonds of each we have on this page and we'll just relay that to the next page. It's going to be the same. So first with this C25H52 which is the paraffin wax. Instead of actually drawing it out where we have a bone structure, each dot representing a carbon, we can see a pattern that we'll observe that will help us figure out how many bonds we actually have in this structure. So let's draw two other molecules to see a pattern. So let's draw a four chain, a four carbon chain. And let's draw out a three carbon chain. So what we see here is that as far as carbon to carbon bonds are concerned, in the four carbon chain we have one, two, and three. And in the three carbon chain we have one, two. So as far as carbon to carbon bonds are concerned, we can't have more than the actual number of carbons that we're dealing with. And in this case, because it's a straight line, the last carbons are not connected. The number of C to C bonds should be one less than the actual number of carbons we have. And as far as the C to H bonds, what we should notice is that every H is connected to a C. And if this molecule were written out, this first one, it would be C3H8, and this, mo or rather, C4H10, and this one would be C3H8. And what we should notice is that because every hydrogen is connected to a carbon, the number of hydrogen carbon bonds is equal to the actual number of hydrogens that we have in either molecule. So if this is the case, before we even draw out C25H52, which we should, we know that there are 24 C to C bonds and that we know that there are 52 C to H bonds. And that's going to help us out in the next page. For oxygen, the structure itself, each oxygen has a valence electrons of 6, so if O2, the number of valence electrons would be 12. We draw out the regular bone structure, the simplest structure that we can, with the two atoms and a single bond. We already used up two electrons with that bond, so we have 10 electrons left. And if we were to split that amongst the two atoms, what we see is that neither of those atoms has a filled octet. Both have seven. So this is when we know that we have to make, and in this case we used up all ten, so we have no more, we have to make a double bond. And because we didn't add or remove any electrons, we're still within the number of valence electrons that we have. And that's the structure for oxygen. And we're working with 38 of those from the equation. So that's what we have. And right now, these are all the ones that have been broken. So we can write that down. And that means that these are all going to be positive. So the next part are the ones that are being formed. Carbon dioxide, using the same valence structure, what we should get is C double bonded to either O and in this case all the atoms have filled octets and we have per molecule two of these bonds 
but we have 25 molecules. So 25 times 2, we have 50 of those bonds. H2O. Looks like that. And per molecule, there are two OH bonds. And we have 26 molecules of them, so there should be 52 bonds of those. So on the next page, we're just transferring everything that we have from the previous page that we found. These, even though they're there, we're not using them because we don't have any of those bonds. And then we just have to calculate whether they're breaking or forming. And in the case of breaking, it's positive. And in the case of forming, it's negative. So here it's a positive 8304. Here it's a positive 21372. Negative 37250. Positive 18772. And negative 24128. And the sum of all of these numbers is negative 12, 9, 30 kilojoules. So that's what we have for the total amount of energy that's produced when one mole of paraffin is burned. Now this is a really big number, but it makes sense when you look at what one mole of paraffin is. So we have per one mole of paraffin, which is C25H52, there are 352.25 grams. Now, we worked with candles that were about 50 grams each, and we only burned them for a couple of minutes per group. And we already noticed that it was getting quite hot in the room. Now, if we were to burn 352.25 grams worth of candle, that's seven whole candles being burned all the way down. So it makes perfect sense that the amount of energy is this big. What we have here is a measured data table that I just created. Now, in this case, these are numbers that I just created. It's not by the experiment. So you have to go based off of the numbers that you have yourself. And I'm going to transfer them over to the table and do the next part based off of these numbers. I have the 100 grams of water, which is what I got from the data observed, and the temperature change, which is what I got from the data observed. So the first part, the energy absorbed by the water. We're going to assume that all the energy absorbed by the water was completely from the candle. So technically, this number, this number, and this number should be equivalent, because we're going to assume that it's a perfect amount of the energy went to the water itself. So in order to calculate the amount of energy absorbed by the water, we need the heat capacity, which we already have. So let's go ahead and write out a for every statement. So for every 4.18 joules, it to make one gram of water go up one degree Celsius. And from the experimental data that I just created, we're assuming that we have 100 grams of water, so we're multiplying by 100, and we're assuming it only went up by 5 degrees Celsius, so we're multiplying by 5. So times 100 times a 5, we're multiplying by 500, and what we should get is 2090 joules. So that's in this box, 2090 joules. Now the energy released by the candle, like I said, we're going to assume it's a perfect amount, so it should just be both that equaling to that. Now the energy released by the candle in kilojoules, to calculate the amount of kilojoules, we know that for every 1,000 joules, there are one kilojoule. And if we're working with 20, 90 joules, we're multiplying by 2.09 what we should get is 2.09 kilojoules worth. Now once again you're doing this with your data. So the mass of the candle that's being burned, we got that from the data previously, the candle before and the candle after, and I wrote down that 
in our experiment it's two grams so the moles of the candle burn we have to remember that we have the molar mass of what the candle is so for every one mole of C25H52 there are 352.25 grams now if we're working with two grams or that's what went down we're dividing by 176 point thirteen and we should get point zero zero five seven moles now here's another thing people said they got really small number for the moles and you should because the molar mass is so huge for the wax itself so in our case this is point zero zero five seven now the heat of combustion so we're trying to figure out how many kilojoules we burned per mole so the heat of combustion for every statement is for every so many kilojoules per one mole. Now we're not working with one mole, we're working with 0 0.0057 moles and the amount of kilojoules we just calculated right there is 2.09 kilojoules. And going from 0 0.0057 to 1 it's multiplying by around 176 and we should get for the kilojoules in this experimental data 367.84 so one of the things that we're doing for the percent error is that we're trying to see based off the bond energy that we did on the front sheet we got 12,930 kilojoules per mole and from our fake experiment that I just made we got 367.84 so we're trying to calculate the percent error which is the difference between what's expected and what's experimental. So in order to do that, we take the experiment data minus what's the calculated divided by the calculated and you multiply that by 100. And in this case just make sure that whatever number you have on the top is the absolute value meaning that even if it's negative make it a positive positive. and if we end up working with both the numbers as being positive we should be fine either way so in this case we have the experimental which is 367.84 minus 12,930 the absolute value of it divided by 12 930. And what we should get is 0.97 times 100. We get 97% error. And that makes sense because the fake data that I gave gave us 30, 367 kilojoules per mole, and the calculated data from the front page got us 12,000 kilojoules per mole. So we have to check what your data says and how close you got to it. And then as far as the two sources of error, you guys can figure out, based off the experimental procedure, how can you account for the differences that you guys have.